Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wimsey, one of my writers. Thanks, Matt, has written me a script. Dave Kroper's Toxic Love Life. Wimsey, if you knew, never read this before, we're going to read it together, dear audience, and find out something about old Dave here. Let's go. David Alexander Kroper who often went by Dave, was 35 years old when he first moved into a large apartment complex in Omaha, Nebraska in the summer of 2012. That day, the sun overhead felt unbearably hot, but after the last of the moving boxes had been unloaded, he was officially ready to crack open an ice cold beer and enjoy his new bachelor lifestyle. Yeah, after moving house, you know, had a busy day, you're doing all that stuff, you're in a new house, like crack over that celebratory beer. That's a good feeling. For the past 12 years, Dave and his longtime girlfriend, Amy Flora, had been struggling to make their relationship work for the sake of their two children 11 year old Callista and nine year old Trey. Whoa, he had kids. Oh, not so young. He's 35 and he's got 11 year olds. He had his first kid at 23, which to me, like, I'm 36 now. Having a 12-year-old kid would be wild. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm way too young for this shit. I'm not criticizing people who have kids young. I'm criticizing myself there. I was not very mature at 23. <laughs> However, no matter how hard they tried to see eye to eye, and they truly did try, they never had been able to sort through their multitude of issues. Working opposing shifts and never setting aside time to nurture their relationship was largely to blame, but the truth was, Dave and Amy had simply grown apart. They were both very different people when they had first started dating in 2000 than they were in 2012, and forcing themselves to stay together despite this was making them both miserable. Once they accepted that it was time to move on, the hardest part was over. The rest was logistics. Thankfully for the entire family, this process had been largely amicable. There had been no dramatic breakup, no screaming matches, and since they'd never married in the first place, no painstaking divorce process. Both had agreed to end things civilly and share custody of their children like adults, which is a breath of fresh air on this channel. I'm like, wait a minute, this is a casual criminalist episode? This isn't starting like a casual criminalist. Why isn't Dave, where, where are his guns? Where's his knife? Where's the abuse? Dave also agreed to move out of their home to give Amy her own space. However, as Dave quickly learned, the bachelor lifestyle isn't all it's cracked up to be. By day, he worked as the manager of an auto repair shop, Hyatt Tire, where he was a popular guy. But after work, his life quickly turned into a sullen affair. Yeah, dude, you're just going to be like lonely because your main person you hang out with for 12 years, you're no longer hanging out with them. And it's like, <laughs> I, went, I went out with my mates for dinner last night and I realized it had been like six or seven weeks since I'd been out with my friends. And if I didn't have my wife and family, I'd be really lonely the whole time. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, you guys want to hang out? It's like, no, mate, we're busy. We've got our own families and shit. And I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> Just let me interrupt today's video to talk about our lovely sponsor today, and that would be Keeps. Now, look, as you can tell, I know a thing or two about male pattern baldness. My hair ran for the hills a long time ago, and it's not coming back. However, I'm fairly confident that if Keeps have been there back in the day when things had just started getting smooth and shiny for me, it might have been a different story. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for guys like me to treat male pattern baldness from the comfort of their own home. That's right, no inconvenient trips to the doctors or pharmacy that eats time out of your busy schedule. You order online and it will be delivered directly to your door at whatever time you deem convenient. And on top of that, it's affordable, typically half the cost of a traditional pharmacy. Keeps offers clinically proven treatments. According to studies, these treatments are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35% plus they have a two-in-one gel that's like a superhero for your hair. Most Keeps customers notice results within six months of starting treatments. And in addition to great treatments, Keeps also offers hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade, so you can help stop your hair loss and make your hair look good while doing it. Keeps has helped nearly a million men keep their hair, with over 4,500 five-star reviews from satisfied customers. Every delivery is non-branded, all in plain packaging, and deliveries are made in plain unbranded trucks, so no need to be embarrassed. It may be too late for me, but it's not too late for you. Halt the loss in its tracks before it's beyond hope and regrow, refresh, and reclaim your head. For a special offer, go to keeps.com slash Simon or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon. And now back to today's video. Since almost all his friends have been Amy's friends as well, they had stuck by her side after the separation and he was left spending many afternoons alone inside his new, scantily decorated apartments. I do also like most of, like we have couple friends and stuff, but most like i don't know i have my own friends and my wife has her own friends which i guess is nice yeah i don't know seems like good to have like a mix 
After just a few weeks of living this sad existence, Dave developed a strong desire to meet new people. Not just friends, but hopefully a new romantic interest. Although, isn't this easier than ever? Like, I don't know, I've got single friends. And I, I've been with my now wife, previously girlfriend, obviously, for so long that it was before, like, these dating apps came along. But nowadays, it seems, like, very easy to just, like, I don't know, download an app and off you go. He said, oh, this was, when was this? 2012. Yeah, I guess this was, like, before, what was that, 14 years ago? That was kind of before all this stuff really kicked off. Jesus Christ, 2012 was 14 years ago. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> He signed up for plentyoffish.com without much hope. As one of many single men in his mid-thirties searching for love online, he didn't exactly feel like the cream of the crop. He actually felt a bit desperate, but to his surprise, had a lot more going for him than most. Thanks to the fact that he had a steady job, was physically fit, and looked presentable, many single mothers and divorcees flocked to his profile. Most were simply looking for companionship like he was. One of those women was named Shana Elizabeth Golar, or Liz to her friends. Like Dave, Liz was a single mother with two children that were, coincidentally, right around the same age as Callista and Trey. For work, Liz ran her own cleaning business, Liz's housekeeping, and her reason for signing up for PlentyOfFish.com was that she too had recently gotten out of a long-term relationship. Well, this all sounds very nice, does it? How is this the beginning of a casual criminalist episode? What's gonna happen? After chatting online for several nights, Dave decided to take his chances and asked Liz out on an in-person date. She eagerly accepted, but their relationship started slow. They first decided to meet for coffee, and it took Dave until the fifth date to make a move. He was still rusty after not dating anyone new in over 12 years, but that night, they kissed and they went back to Dave's apartment. Over the next several weeks, the pair began meeting up regularly for sex, but it didn't take long for Dave to decide that Liz wasn't the right person for him. Oh, that's sad. It's not like he wasn't attracted to her sexually, he very much was, but it was clear by their conversations that they were both looking for very different things. After spending 12 years devoted to Amy, Dave wasn't looking to jump back into anything serious. He wanted something informal, but he also wasn't looking to hook up with a different woman every night. The arrangement he had in mind was somewhat unique. He was searching for someone he could connect with and talk to as a friend, someone he enjoyed spending time with, but he also wanted someone he could have sex with on occasion. Most people call this a friends with benefit arrangement. But Dave had never heard that term. Liz, on the other hand, was looking for a long-term partner and a stepfather for her children. This fundamental difference quickly caused things to fizzle. However, the time Dave spent with Liz had not been wasted. As he tells it, she was the person who reminded him how to date, how to be romantic, and his prospects with the ladies, both online and in the real world, quickly improved. Soon, he was going on multiple dates with different women each week, sometimes just for coffee, other times for much more. He told these women the same thing he'd told Liz. No commitment, just companionship and sex. Some women were fine with this arrangement, others were not. However, by late September, the oppressive summer heat was finally giving way to cool autumn, and Dave met someone who would make him reconsider his aversion to monogamy. This sounds completely normal. What's going on? <laughs> What's he going to do? What's going to happen to him? The Bombshell Kari Father was a tall, attractive 37-year-old woman with beautiful eyes and a bright smile who arrived at Dave's workplace one morning to have a 2002 Ford Explorer serviced. As Dave inspected the interior of her vehicle, he felt an immediate attraction towards her, and he thought that she might feel the same way towards him. Since she wasn't wearing a wedding ring, he wanted to ask her out on a date right then and there, but he felt that it wouldn't be appropriate considering the circumstances. He watched as she left Hyatt Tire that day and kicked himself all afternoon for not acting. Again, this seems completely normal, and Dave seems like quite a good guy. <laughs> But as luck would have it, Dave happened to cross Carrie just a few days later under much different circumstances, this time while clicking through profiles on plentyoffish.com. He instantly recognized her face when it flashed across his screen. Her profile said that she was twice divorced, the mother of a 14-year-old son named Maxwell, and looking to date casually. Jackpot, Dave thought. Feeling emboldened by the late hour, he drafted a short message that indicated they'd previously met while asking her out for coffee. Unfortunately, this message got no reply, but a few days later, Carrie showed up at his workplace once again for another repair, and this time, they hit it off. According to Dave, his and Carrie's whirlwind romance was exactly what he'd been searching for. Passionate, yet casual. Like him, Carrie wasn't eager to commit to anyone after her divorce, but she was searching for someone to talk about her failed marriage with, about the struggles of raising children without a partner, and many of the other things that Dave had been dealing with since the end of his relationship with Amy. It was cathartic for both of them. <laughs> What is going to happen? Why is the bombshell? For the first date, the pair met for dinner after work, but their chemistry was so strong that they immediately went back to Dave's apartment. This became a regular occurrence, as over the next two weeks, they'd meet up at nearly every opportunity. 
Many nights, Carrie would sleep over at Dave's apartment because her workplace was nearby. She was a computer programmer, working for a company called West Corporation, but her home was located in Macedonia, Iowa, a town approximately 30 miles west of Omaha, just across the Nebraska-Iowa state line. Because Max stayed with Carrie's parents, Nancy and Mark Rainey, most of the time, this made it very convenient for her to meet with Dave for some adult activities. According to Dave, his time with Carrie was something truly special. The sex was amazing, of course, but there was also something else about her that attracted him. Unlike most of the girls that he'd dated recently, Dave genuinely enjoyed spending time with Carrie, and he liked hearing about her life and the people in it. And while neither he nor Carrie wanted to be exclusive, Dave's other romantic partners gradually fell by the wayside as he stopped returning their text messages and emails. Although he never intended to, he began subconsciously considering the possibility of a future with her. That future, of course, would include her son Max to some degree, but Dave didn't see that as an issue. One day, Dave saw an excellent deal on a used Volkswagen, and he immediately thought of Max. The boy would be driving soon, Dave knew, so he texted Kari to let her know. The car was a fixer-upper, but Dave told her that he didn't mind putting in a few extra hours at the shop in the afternoons to get it up and running. Dave seems like a great dude! What's he gonna do? Oh, God! (laughs) Kari agreed that this was an excellent idea and immediately purchased it for Dave to begin working on. Based on this, it seems that, to some degree, Carrie was thinking long-term as well. But what neither she nor Dave knew at the time was that their relationship was about to end just as quickly as it began, and Dave would spend years desperately wishing that he'd never met Carrie in the first place. Oh my god, wait a minute. I just got chilled out by spiders. Carrie, the psycho. (laughs) The The next section's called the psycho. Oh no. On the morning of the 13th of November 2012, Dave woke her inside Carrie's home to find the bed beside him empty. He and Carrie had met up the previous evening for dinner, and the dinner had turned into much more. He smiled as he dragged himself to his feet to get ready to work. A few moments later, Dave emerged from Carrie's bedroom to find her sitting on the living room sofa with her work laptop in front of her. She had awoken before him to get a head start on a big work project that had a fast approaching deadline. Dave said goodbye to her as he exited through her front door and made plans to meet her at his apartment later that afternoon to pick up where they left off. When Dave arrived at Hyatt Tire a short time later, he assumed his workday would be the same boring routine it normally was. However, at around 10 a.m., his phone buzzed in his pocket. When he looked at the screen, he saw a message from Carrie. He raised an eyebrow, wondering if it accidentally left something important at her house, but after unlocking his phone, he read a message that was completely unexpected. Out of nowhere, Carrie was asking him to move in with her. David considered this for a moment but didn't know how to respond. He believed that he and Carrie were on the same page about what they were and weren't looking for at the moment. But now he wasn't so sure. He did like Carrie, but moving in together felt like a huge step, one that Dave simply wasn't ready to take. Somewhat annoyed by Carrie's sudden suggestion, Dave quickly stepped away from his workstation to type out her response. He told her politely, yet firmly, no, in hoping this would be the end of the conversation, but it wasn't. Just a moment later, David's phone began buzzing wildly as a flurry of text messages flashed across his screen. One every few seconds, they read, Fine, f*** you. I'm seeing somebody else. Don't contact me again. I hate you. Go away. Oh my lord. It's not Dave. It's not Dave, is it? I was like, Dave seems like a good dude. Because there were many customers at Hyatt Tire that morning, Dave barely had time to read the messages as they appeared, much less reply, so he switched off his notifications and put his phone away, intending to respond on his lunch break. However, by the time that lunch break arrived, he had received so many angry messages that he couldn't be asked to read them all. In that moment, staring at what was undeniably psychotic behavior, Dave decided that his and Carrie's time together had officially come to an end. It was a shame, he thought. Carrie seemed so nice, but Dave's co-workers assured him that he'd dodged a bullet. They had no idea that the harassment was only beginning. I I think if this happened to me, I'd be like, are you okay? Like, I wouldn't be like, it's done. I'd be like, something's up. Like, what happened? Are you all right? Do you, like, this seems like manic behavior, right? The, uh, what's that condition called? Like, is it bipolar where someone's up and down? I'd be like, inclined to be like, because they could be fine. They just, might just need some help. Later that night, all hell broke loose when the messages started up again, and this time they were even more disturbing. I hate you so much, I want to drive a knife into your heart, and I will destroy your life and take your happiness. Oh my lord. Dave truly couldn't believe what he was reading. But even after switching off his phone, the harassment didn't stop. At this point, I'd be like, "Did her cra- is her ex-husband crazy and has her phone or something? Like, what is going on? When he checked his email inbox, he found even more messages in Carrie that contained the same types of threats. He didn't reply. 
The following day, he received hundreds of angry text messages, dozens per hour. They were coming in constantly, and they weren't just threatening him. They were threatening his friends and family as well. One night, Liz Goliar, the woman Dave had connected with shortly after signing up for PlentyOfFish.com, called him to inform him that Carrie had started sending her harassing messages as well. One of them read, If you don't keep your hands or lips off my man, I will hurt you. Had Carrie lost her mind? Dave hadn't seen Liz in weeks, not since he made it clear that he wasn't searching for a committed relationship, so he wasn't sure why Carrie would be so upset with her. Plus, as far as Dave was aware, Carrie and Liz had only ever interacted with one another once, when Liz had stopped by his apartment to pick up some clothes that she'd left behind while Carrie was there. Carrie hadn't seemed bothered by Liz's presence, and she hadn't brought Liz up again during any of her subsequent meetups. So, what had changed? Was it really just the fact that he had declined to move in with her? One day, Dave received the following about Liz. She's a fat cow. She looks like she lost her puppy. Maybe she'll do us a favor and kill herself. LOL. And Liz wasn't the only one in Dave's circle of friends being harassed either. Amy, the mother of his children, had begun receiving nasty messages as well, as were the other employees of Hyatt Tire. While Dave was at work, a random number would begin calling for hours at a time. Whenever Dave or one of his co-workers would answer the phone, the line would disconnect. However, once the handset was returned to its cradle, the phone would start ringing again. This went on for nearly five hours straight one day. Oh my god, this is so terrifying. Like, can you imagine being in this... Like, you're just a regular-ass person going about your regular-ass life, and suddenly it's like something crazy has entered your orbit, and it's just like, this is wild. you got to get a restraining order, my dude. When Drave tried to call Carrie's number, she wouldn't answer. Instead, a fresh slew of angry messages would arrive, telling him to never contact her again, to leave her alone because she hated him. But Carrie wouldn't do the same for Dave, and her threats of violence began to become more plausible as time went on. In one particularly chilling instance, Dave received a text message that read, I see you. You're sitting in your chair with your feet propped up wearing a blue shirt. When this particular message had come through, Dave was doing exactly what the message described, sitting in his living room's lazy boy recliner with his feet up watching television and trying to unwind. Dave then stood and looked out the window, but he saw no one. Carrie had seemingly left before sending the message. A few days later, he received another. You're in your robe. You just got out the shower. I see you. Oh my lord. This is like a horror movie. Once again, the message was correct. But when Dave looked outside the window, he again saw no one. Running outside, he searched the bushes around his apartment, but Carrie had disappeared without a trace. Dave learns where she'd gone the following morning, when Liz informed him that Carrie had taken her harassment to the next level. She'd broken into Liz's garage the previous night, stolen one of her checkbooks, and spray-painted the word whore on one of her interior walls. While Liz didn't have solid proof that Carrie was responsible, she assumed it was because, well, who else would do that? Dave was completely dumbstruck. He told Liz to file a report with the police, but Liz, who seemed to be growing annoyed with Dave's psychotic ex, understandably so, said that she had already done so and hung up the phone in anger. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, Liz, I, I get why she's doing this. Because you'll be like, what the f***, man? What did you bring into my orbit? And she doesn't know the story. And <laughs> poor Liz, poor Dave. Attempting to distance himself from Carrie, Dave then changed his cell phone number and closed his plentyoffish.com account. But this solution was ultimately fruitless. After less than a week of peace, the text messages started arriving again. Dave wasn't sure how, but Carrie had found his new number. At that point, I'd be like, she was divorced twice, right, previously. I'd speak, I'd, I don't know how you can find this out. Could you find this out in 2012? Maybe like with the internet or whatever, or get a private detective and be like, I need to know who the previous husbands were. I need to have a word with them because what is going on? Please come home. Unbeknownst to David, while his life was being thrown into chaos, Carrie's mother, Nancy, was having troubles of her own. Another thing would be to like reach out to the parents, to find out who her parents are, and be like, Hey, I don't know how this is going to go, but I need to talk to you about something. And just get a beat on whether they're crazy or not. And they'd be like, oh, because it could be. What are you talking about? You psycho. Leave our daughter alone. She, you obviously did something horrible to her. But it could also very much be, oh, she suffers from bipolar disorder or whatever medical condition this could be. We're really sorry. Can you help us like, get her the help she needs? Or something like that. Because this is like not healthy behavior in any sense of the word. You see, the same day that Carrie's harassment had started, she had received several strange messages as well. The first came from Carrie's workplace, and it claimed that Carrie had not arrived for work as scheduled and asked if she was alright. 
Nancy was listed as Carrie's emergency contact, but as far as we know, her daughter was perfectly fine. Nancy had just spoken to Carrie the previous evening, and nothing Carrie had said indicated that she was feeling ill or planning to call out the following day. She had actually said the opposite, that she was planning to go in early and get a head start on a work project. Worried, Nancy immediately dialed Carrie's number, but Carrie's cell phone went straight to voicemail. A few seconds later, Carrie's name then appeared on Nancy's screen with a message underneath it. In this message, Carrie said that she'd found a new job and had decided to abandon her position at the West Corporation. Something weird. I'm at this point being like, has something happened to Carrie? Because this behavior just came so wildly out of the blue. And now her mum can't contact her or talk to her. Which is like, has something happened to her? Because we've had this before where people have stolen phones of people they've kidnapped or murdered or whatever and carried on texting their friends and emailing their friends in order to make them think they're still alive while the murderer gets away to, like, Lebanon or some sh**. Nancy tried calling again, but there was no answer. Obviously, the sudden change was concerning, but not for the reason you might suspect. You see, Carrie had a long history of erratic behavior. All throughout her early 20s, she had suffered from depression, anxiety, and a mixed bag of other mental and mood disorders. These had seriously affected her life and relationships with other people. It was only recently that she'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, bingo, and for this she'd been prescribed mood stabilizers to assist in keeping the worst of her symptoms in check. Okay. Fantastic. So she's clearly off her meds, and she needs to go back on her meds, and then hopefully this will all end in a massive apology. This diagnosis had changed Carrie's life for the better. Since she began treatment, her mental health had been improving, which is what had allowed her to acquire a steady job, a job that Carrie had never once stated she planned to leave before that morning. This is just a disease. She needs to be treated, or like change her meds need to be, if she's off the meds, she needs to be back on the meds. If the meds aren't working, she needs to be on different meds. Like, it just seems like she's broken and it, and these drugs were fixing her. This is kind of exactly what I thought it could be. In fact, Carrie had been so devoted to her job, she had been picking up extra hours for months, which is why Max had been staying overnight at Nancy's house so often. For the first time in a long time, Carrie seemed to finally be getting her life together. However, Nancy feared that Carrie had decided to stop taking a medication. Now, for those of you who are unaware, bipolar disorder was once referred to as manic depression, and its symptoms usually present as extreme mood swings that cycle between manic emotional highs and depressive emotional lows. Those affected will often have difficulty regulating their emotions and may even make hasty poorly banned decisions on a whim, especially when unmedicated. The Mayo Clinic's website describes it in the following way. When you become depressed, you may feel sad or hopeless and lose interest or pleasure in most activities. When your mood shifts to mania or hypomania, less extreme than mania, you may feel euphoric, full of energy, or unusually irritable. These mood swings can affect sleep, energy, activity, judgment, behavior, and the ability to think clearly. Episodes of mood swings may occur rarely or multiple times a year. While most people will experience some emotional symptoms between episodes, some may not experience any. Several times since starting her treatment plan, Carrie had indicated that a medication made her feel numb and had decided to stop taking it without her doctor's approval. Bad idea. Just try. There's, I'm sure there's other drugs for this. This has been around for a long time. There's probably a whole range of things they can try. You've got to go see your doctor. You can't just come off your drugs. Each of these times had negatively affected her progress overall, so Carrie had always decided to start taking the medication again on her own. Nancy feared, however, that this time might be different. Over the next few days, when Nancy and other members of Carrie's family checked her Facebook account, they discovered posts talking about her move to Kansas, how she would miss her friends and family, and how she couldn't wait for Max to join her soon. When Nancy asked Max if Carrie had ever mentioned moving to Kansas with her, he confirmed that she had on more than one occasion, but that they'd never made any concrete plans. Over the next few days, Nancy continued reaching out to Carrie through calls, texts, and Facebook messages, begging her to come home or at least pick up the phone. In a later interview, Nancy said, When I'd get text messages from Carrie, I'd say, Please, call me. I just need to hear your voice. Yet Carrie would never answer. Eventually, Nancy's concern grew exponentially when her daughter missed a very important date, her stepbrother, John's wedding. As author Leslie Rule explains in a 2020 book, A Tangled Web, A Cyberstalker, A Deadly Obsession, and The Twisting Path to Justice, John's wedding actually represented more to Carrie and her family than normal wedding, which is already a significant event for most families. You see, Carrie's biological father, Dennis, had been suffering from late-stage stomach cancer and didn't have much left longer to live, yet he planned to attend the wedding regardless. This meant a lot to Carrie, John, and everyone else in their immediate family, because they knew that it would likely be the last time they'd all be together before Dennis passed away. John and his future wife, Hilary, had even moved their wedding forward by over seven months to ensure that Dennis could be present. Carrie had missed the wedding without even calling or texting. 
oh, I'm confused, like, whether she's been kidnapped or whether she's off her meds. Because it's still like, she's not even speaking to them at all. Not, she, they've never heard her voice, which is like, real suspect. At this point, Nancy called the police to report her daughter as missing, and an officer from the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office soon arrived to take down her details. Nancy told the officer about everything, the missed wedding, the sudden job change, the fact that she hadn't checked in on her own son in weeks, and said that she knew Carrie was in some sort of trouble. Plus, by this point, all calls and texts had stopped altogether. In response to this, the officer told Nancy that Carrie was an adult and that deciding to suddenly move away and miss an important family event was not enough to warrant a full investigation. Then, when the officer learned of Carrie's bipolar disorder, which explained her erratic behavior perfectly, all of Nancy's hope dissipated. The police would add Carrie's name to the U.S. National Missing Persons database, but the local authorities wouldn't take any further steps without more evidence. Later that year, after a long, hard-fought battle, Dennis's cancer took him. Carrie was not present at the funeral. When Nancy sent another message begging Carrie for an explanation, her daughter's reply was, I'm sorry I missed the funeral. Please make it stop. Despite the fact that Carrie's harassment seemed to be designed to scare everyone in Dave's life away, it actually had the opposite effect. By the time January 2013 rolled around, Dave and Amy were meeting up regularly so Dave could still be a part of Callista and Trey's lives, despite the threats they were all receiving. At times, while Dave and Liz sat together in his living room watching TV unable to sleep, both of their phones would begin flashing as abusive messages poured in. They were being watched from outside yet again, the messages claimed, and Dave was instructed to kick the whore out now or else they would both die. Liz read these messages and began to cry. Dave called the police. This report obviously wasn't the first one that Dave had filed, but like those that preceded it, the police informed him that they had been unable to contact Carrie since the harassment began despite their best efforts. Whenever they tried to trace her cell phone, they found it was pinging off cell towers all over Omaha, but by the time they arrived at the triangulated position, her phone had already moved. There had also not been any confirmed sightings of Carrie's 2002 Ford Explorer anywhere around his or Liz's neighborhoods. It appeared to the police that they were chasing a ghost. When Dave tried to change his phone number again, Carrie would find other ways to contact him until she eventually discovered his new number. How are they doing this? Hey, isn't it quite hard to find people's phone numbers? He would receive random friend requests on Facebook that would turn out to be Carrie in disguise. Wait, who's also accepting random friend requests on Facebook? It's like, <laughs> I don't have Facebook anymore. But if someone sent me that in the past, I'd be like, who are you? I mean, if I, I have Facebook, I have like a fan Facebook page or whatever that I set up. So like someone's not going to squat on it or whatever. But and, and that gets a lot of messages, but I don't read them. And like back in the past, before I was like a F list internet celebrity, I just like if someone sent me a friend request, I'd be like, oh, how do we know each other? And they'd be like, oh, from this. And I'd be like, oh, hey, hey. If it was someone I didn't know, they'd just be like, oh, we don't. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> well, I'm not adding you as a friend then, am I, you weirdo? As the police continued their seemingly futile investigation for several more months, the harassment continued unabated until August 2013, when Carrie's crimes escalated yet again. This time, those crimes were ones directed at Liz, who Carrie seemed to blame for her and Dave's failed relationship. On the morning of Friday the 16th, Dave received a call at his workplace from Liz. She was hysterical and said that Carrie had set her house on fire. Thankfully, Liz said neither she nor her children had been inside, but her four pets, two dogs, a cat and a snake had been. They had all perished. Her home's interior had also been charred and her furniture, clothes and all her belongings had been ruined. Dave dropped everything and rushed to Liz's side. This got real. Like, this was already crazy, but this is properly proper crimes are happening. According to fire investigators, the blaze had originated in six different spots all throughout the home, meaning that arson was the only feasible cause. Additionally, a red jerry can had been left inside the living room when traces of gasoline, which had been used as an accelerant, were detected where the fire had done the most damage. Despite this, however, the exterior of the home looked untouched. This was because the amateurish arsonist had made a critical error. Because the blaze had been so large, the flames had quickly depleted all the readily available oxygen inside the small home, effectively causing the fire to smother itself before it could spread further. When Dave asked Liz how she knew Carrie was the one responsible, Liz presented him with a text message that she had received the previous night at around the time the fire was set. I don't know. Liz, how do you know it's Carrie? Dave, Liz replies, she's the only psycho person in my life. Like, 
<laughs> if my house burned down, if I was in this position and just assuming that, uh, what's her fate? Liz has just a regular ass life like I do. And there was a psycho in my life. I'd be like, well, it's the psycho person, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, the message reads, Dave doesn't want you talking to him anymore. He wants to be with me. We are trying a new relationship. We have had sex recently. He loves me and always will. He doesn't want you back. Hope you and your kids burn to death. Duff. Liz had obviously turned this over to fire investigators and the police, who were then actively searching for Carrie at that moment. In response, Dave assured Liz that he had not seen Carrie recently and that certainly they weren't attempting to rekindle their relationship. Liz claimed to believe him, but she never let him forget that he was the cause of all this drama. I mean, steady. Steady. It's like, yes, technically true, but also, he is just Dave. He's just a regular dude who got also wrapped up into a crazy situation. Later that day, David received a message that read, I set that nasty whore's house on fire. I hope that the whore and her kids die in it. Not long after this, Dave purchased a 9mm Smith & Wesson semi-automatic pistol for protection. Good move. Also, Liz, you need one of these. The Investigation Following Carrie's brazen arson attack against Liz, the police began devoting real resources to investigating her case. They assigned two seasoned detectives to it, in the hopes of tracking her down before she committed any more acts of violence. Based on data collected from Dave and Liz's phones, which had been willingly provided by both to aid in the investigation, the detectives were able to learn several important things about how Carrie had been contacting them. First, they estimated that Carrie had changed her number over 30 times to circumvent Dave's attempts to block her messages from coming through, and that those messages were untraceable because it appeared that Carrie had been using a text message routing software to hide her location. They also saw dozens of Facebook accounts that had been created and abandoned, yet none of this provided any leads on where Carrie might be hiding because she'd created these accounts while using a VPN to mask her IP address and location. Today's video brought to you by Surfshark. Um be funny if it was wouldn't it that'd be a great spot for the ads <laughs> planning on stalking your ex-boyfriend want to rile him up make sure the police don't know your location with a vpn ah but uh, she knows how to do all this stuff right because she's a computer programmer when this digital search failed to yield any concrete results they then turned to carrie's home inside they found that many of her favorite clothes and personal items were missing they all appeared to have been hastily packed indicating that carrie was in a hurry to leave the morning that she was last seen by dave Trying to track Carrie down in Kansas, the state that Carrie claimed to be moving to for work, also yielded no results. Eventually, Carrie's 2002 Ford Explorer was discovered abandoned less than a mile away from her home. In it, the police found that the dashboard and console had been wiped clean, but they were able to recover one partial print from a mint container. This fingerprint did not belong to Carrie. They were also unable to match it to anyone in her family. Oh my lord, now, now I'm going back to the, has someone kidnapped her? But then, what is that person's motivate? Oh my god. Wait. This is going to be a wild theory. This is a wild theory. So, maybe worth throwing it out. But did anyone else right now think it's the ex, it's one of her ex-husbands who has got jealous, done something to her, and then now is doing all of this stuff? That would be, that's a pretty wild leap. I don't think it would be responsible for police to make that leap, but I'd definitely go talk to the ex-husbands. Obviously, all these findings combined painted a pretty concerning picture. The police still had no concrete evidence to prove their suspicions. They interviewed Carrie's neighbors, her family, her ex-husband, and anyone else related to her, but after following every lead imaginable, the case went cold. They informed Dave and Liz that unless Carrie turned up somewhere, they had very little hope of finding her. Really? People just disappear like that? What happens when she wants a job? Or like, use a bank card? Or anything that requires ID? Aren't the police going to be like, well, here she is. Let's go get her. Over the next two years, from August of 2013 to November 2015, Dave attempted to move on with his life, but Carrie's harassment continued unabated, and it seemed to come and go in waves. Sometimes entire weeks would go by without a single threat being sent, while other times Dave would receive hundreds of messages over the course of a weekend. At first, these fluctuations seemed random, but eventually he realized that the frequency of the messages increased whenever he began dating someone new. Yes. Despite still being stalked and threatened, David decided that he couldn't put his love life on hold indefinitely and attempted to start seeing new women again. I mean, fair enough. What's he supposed to do? Like, it's been years. Years! What's he supposed to do? Just be like a bachelor and celibate? <laughs> 
This did not go well because once Dave would get friendly with someone, Carrie would begin harassing them as well. Unsurprisingly, most women did not stick around for very long. Eventually, Dave moved out of his apartment and across town, but even this did not stop the harassment. Dave even suspected that someone may have been inside his apartment while he was at work. His suspicions were confirmed in November of 2015, when he returned home to find that the pistol he'd purchased was missing. Uh, I I went into my bedroom and opened the door to my closet, and the box my pistol resides in was hanging over the ledge of the shelf. I grabbed the box, and there was nothing in it. This is like a horror movie. This is a f***ing horror movie. Dave's obvious first assumption was that Carrie had taken it, but he had no idea how she could have gained access to his apartment. None of the doors or windows were broken, and very few people had a key, which was intentional. However, when Dave told Liz about the missing firearms, he suggested something that had the potential to change everything. According to her, it didn't make sense that Carrie would continue her harassment campaign for so long against a man that she had only dated casually for less than two weeks. It had been nearly three full years since the messages began, and yet Carrie showed no signs of slowing down. Yeah, that is utterly crazy likewise liz's inboxes were still filled as well despite the fact that she and dave had not formally dated for quite some time after the message was first started she and dave had began meeting up often but both of them had since moved on liz had even moved in with another man named garrett sloan so there was little reason for carrie to think that she and dave were still seeing one another this wasn't exactly a revelation to dave because throughout the years he had slowly come to the same conclusion on his own yet if that were true If someone were posing as Carrie to harass them all, he had no idea who it could be or why they seemed to care so much about his love life. For this, Liz had a theory. She suggested that the harasser was another woman in Dave's life who had been scorned, someone who had once been a much bigger part of his life than Carrie had, someone who had a key to his apartment because she shared custody of her and Dave's two children, Amy, Flora. No! Oh my God, that's a hell of a twist! Liz, that's a, that, that theory's crazier than mine. Oh my God, I have shivers. That's crazy. Oh my God, has he, she killed her? What? Despite the fact that Liz's theory made logical sense and that everything she said was true, Dave couldn't bring himself to believe it. He had known Amy for over 15 years and didn't believe she was capable of doing the things that Carrie, or whoever was pretending to be Carrie, had said and done. Plus, they still saw each other often, and Amy had never once expressed a desire to get back together or that she was angry at him for dating other women. It just didn't add up. Dave told this to Liz. However, she remained unconvinced and took her theory to the police anyway. On December 4th, 2015, Liz Valder complained against Amy with the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office, in which she asserted that she believed Amy was the person responsible for the harassment and had been responsible since the very beginning. While at the sheriff's office, Liz laid out her reasoning and allowed the officers to procure a copy of her cell phone just as she had done after the fire. She told them about the missing gun and said that she wanted Amy to be brought in for questioning because she feared for her life. In response, the police told Liz that they'd look into her claims and get in touch with Amy if the cell phone data she had provided contained any useful evidence. The officer then gave Liz his cell phone number to call in case she remembered anything else that could aid in the investigation. He sent her on her way, but it would be less than 48 hours before he heard from Liz again. By then, she had been in the hospital. The following afternoon at around 6pm, a 911 operator in Potawatomi County received an urgent call from a cell phone located in the nearby Big Lake Park. The caller was Liz Goyla, who said that she needed immediate aid because she'd been shot. Within minutes, officers and paramedics arrived on the scene. They found Liz beside her car with a gunshot wound in her thigh. As they worked to stop the bleeding, Liz identified her attacker as Amy Flora. She said she had stopped by Big Lake Park that afternoon to get some light exercise and clear her mind, but Amy had ambushed her, shot at her multiple times with a handgun, and then fled into the nearby woods on foot. I'm beginning to think, oh my god, this is a story I feel like I am actually reading like a Netflix miniseries. This is crazy, and if this was a Netflix miniseries, right now I'd be speculating that old Liz is responsible for this because dave seems like a good guy amy was with him for 15 years so she's probably also all right i'm just very much thinking now that liz wanted more from dave dave broke up with her and got together with carrie liz did something to carrie and basically posed as carrie as a psycho so that dave would get back into her life but then again liz has moved on with her life 
So why would that be? This is exactly me and my wife. We watch these sorts of shows on Netflix, and we ha- like we'll always be pausing it to have these like long discussions, exactly like this, about who did it. <laughs> Immediately, officers present at the scene began combing those woods while other officers were routed to Amy's home, which was only a short distance away. As the latter officers pulled into Amy's driveway, they noticed that her car was parked nearby, indicating she was home. They radioed for backup and then approached the home with their guns drawn, pounding on the heavy front door with fists. From inside, they heard a small voice calling out to them. Who's there? The officers responded, There's the police! Open up! Amy's face was stark white when she opened the door and saw the officer standing before her with her guns drawn. She was caught completely off guard when they ordered her to place her hands above her head. She was also dressed in flannel pajamas and appeared to have been relaxing in her living room when they arrived. Seeing that Amy posed no immediate threat to them, the officers lowered their weapons and informed the frightened woman what she had been accused of. To this, Amy said that if the situation wasn't so tense, she could always laugh because the idea that she shot someone was ridiculous. She denied the allegation outright, and the officers believed her. To them, Amy simply did not look like a woman who had just sped home from the park after attempting to murder someone. When the officers interviewed Amy's neighbors, they confirmed that Amy had been home all afternoon. When they checked her car, they found that it was ice cold and hadn't been moved for several hours. Amy was not the shooter. Oh my. Oh my. Did I get this right? I'm beginning to think that I got this right. The cards come tumbling down. While in hospital, Liz continued to claim that Amy was the one responsible for shooting her, despite the fact that officers assured her Amy's alibi was airtight. They suggested to Liz that she was mistaken, and that because Liz had just filed a complaint against Amy, she had subconsciously placed Amy's face in her attacker's body. Liz's eyes had played a trick on her, they said, but Liz refused to accept it. She doubled down and stated, in no uncertain terms, that Amy was her attacker. So what exactly is going on here? Well, that was a question that the police were very eager to figure out. While looking deeper into the relationship between Liz and Amy, investigators turned to the complaint that Liz had just filed the previous day and alongside it, the cell phone data that Liz had provided. If you recall, this was not the first time that Liz had allowed her cell phone to be searched. The first search had occurred in January of 2013, shortly after the harassment began, and then a second search had been conducted shortly after the arson. Those downloads of Liz's cell phone data had failed to yield any usable information. However, police had used an entirely different method to download Liz's data this time around. This time, not only could the police view the contents of her phone, they could also recover deleted data, including deleted text messages, photos, apps and app data, emails, and much more. It was a complete download, a carbon copy of the phone, and what investigators found within was damning. As it turns out, Liz had been using a texting app to create fake numbers in order to pose as Carrie and harass Dave. Boom! Nailed it! As well as Amy, herself, and countless others for years. Police recovered tens of thousands of these text messages, and they also found evidence of the text scheduling service that they'd long suspected was being used to make the harassment campaign easier to manage. Instead of having to sit beside her cell phone all day, Liz had been able to simply write out a few hundred text messages whenever she had spare time, and then just let them slowly be delivered to her targets over the next few days or weeks. With this evidence in hand, police then secured a sealed digital search warrant for Liz's internet history, along with the websites that she often used, including Google and Yahoo, as well as Facebook and various dating websites. Here, they found that Liz had created hundreds of fake email addresses, fake dating profiles, and fake review accounts. With them, she had posed as Carrie online many, many times and provided false updates for her friends and family to read. She had also been running an online catfishing scam where she tricked men around the world into giving her money. They estimated that keeping up this extensive ruse would have taken Liz upwards of 50 hours per week, even with the various apps she used to help manage it. Understanding that Liz had attempted to play them, the police were eager to make an arrest. However, before they could act, they needed to answer a much bigger question. If Liz had been posing as Carrie this entire time, where was the real Carrie? Well, although the police had no solid evidence to prove it, they believed that Liz had murdered Carrie. Their suspicion came from a deleted photograph recovered from Liz's phone that showed Carrie's Ford Explorer's license plate. This photo had been taken in late December of 2012, between the time when Carrie was officially declared a missing person by her mother and when police discovered the car abandoned near her home. There was no innocent reason for such a picture to exist. Additionally, police recovered a long-deleted email in which Liz, posing as Carrie, had contacted Carrie's employer shortly after her disappearance to resign, while also providing them with the name of a potential replacement herself. Was this enough to arrest her for murder? 
Well, no, because it was all still circumstantial. The police had no body, no crime scene, no murder weapon, and they still didn't know for certain that Carrie was dead. If they wanted to arrest Liz for harassment and for filing a false report, they could. But if they wanted murder charges to stick, they needed more. They needed to find something that proved Carrie had been harmed because at this point, it was still possible she was alive and had simply abandoned her family and not returned. Ironically, Liz would give the police exactly what they needed just days after the shooting, so let me explain. At this point, Liz had been released from hospital after receiving treatment for her wounds, but she wasn't aware that the police were investigating her for murder, nor was she aware that the police had received search warrants for her internet activity. She simply believed that the only reason Amy hadn't been arrested was because of a lack of evidence against her. Liz was determined to provide them with that evidence, and she hoped to frame Amy for everything the shooting, the harassment, the fire, and for orchestrating the disappearance of Carrie Father. Posing as Amy, Liz took responsibility for the shooting by drafting and sending several emails to herself in which she describes in detail how Carrie had been murdered. She wrote, I attacked her with a knife. I stabbed her three to four times in the chest and stomach area. I took her out and burned her. I stuffed her body in a garbage bag with crap. In another, she wrote, I drove Carrie out to the woods. She was still begging for her life, crying, wanting me to let her go. In a third, after I killed Carrie, I contacted her mum, Nancy, pretending to be Carrie. I even went out to her place and got some of Carrie's clothes and other things to make it look like she ran away. A fourth one read, I really did kill Carrie, and I did do it in her own car. Police believe that these emails were a genuine account of how Carrie had been murdered, and their confidence came from evidence discovered inside Carrie's car. After reading the emails, investigators tore into the fabric of Carrie's passenger seat and discovered a large amount of blood. The fingerprints on the mint container inside Carrie's car was also matched to Liz. In another email, Liz describes a tattoo that Carrie had on her left foot, a yin-yang tattoo. This tattoo was significant because it was not public knowledge, nor was it something Carrie often talked about because of the tattoo's painful backstory. It had been one of a matching set that she'd gotten with her ex-husband. While this was all still circumstantial, the police feared that Liz would escalate her crimes further if she remained free. On Thursday, the 22nd of December 2016, Liz was arrested and charged with Carrie Farber's murder. The Pictures When the police revealed to Dave the identity of his longtime stalker, he was furious. He recalled the many nights that he and Liz had spent together, comforting each other as the messages rolled in. He realized that it had all been a lie, and he felt both embarrassed and guilty for not recognizing it sooner. Oh, Dave, mate, it's not your fault. Dave, you've had it so rough. I mean, not as rough as Carrie, she got murdered, but this is like, this is an insane, just there, there are insane people out there, and you and people around you have fallen into one of these insane people's crazy webs. Hoping to aid the police's investigation through any means possible, Dave turned over every electronic device he owned that Liz may have had access to at some point during their time together, and this is when the police made the discovery that would lock their case down once and for all. One of the electronic devices that Dave surrendered is described in court documents as a tablet computer that Dave kept inside his apartment. This tablet did not belong to Liz, and it was searched thoroughly without luck. However, police also noticed that there was a micro SD card inserted into the tablet. This card had at one time been used by Liz for additional storage inside her cell phone. Since then, the card had been formatted, but it had not been completely erased. From this memory card, police recovered over 13,000 photographs that had been taken by Liz's phone, as well as backups of innumerable text messages that had been sent by Liz during the time that she and Dave were together. Several of these photographs contained extremely disturbing imagery. In one, a flesh-colored object could be seen with what appears to be some sort of black marking on it. This object was later determined to be a decomposing human foot, and the black marking was determined to be a tattoo of a yin-yang symbol. When police interviewed Carrie's ex-husband, they compared his tattoo to the one seen in the photograph, and it was a perfect match. Unfortunately, the location data could not be recovered, so the police had no way of knowing where they had been taken. As such, Carrie Farber's body has never been recovered. At Liz's trial, the prosecution presented a narrative comprised of obsession, manipulation, deception, hatred, jealousy. They stated that Dave and Liz had briefly dated in the summer of 2012, but that Liz couldn't handle being rejected. She'd always hoped that Dave would return to her, but when Dave met and began dating Carrie Farber regularly, she decided to do whatever it took to break them up. Based on Dave's recollection of the morning of November 13, 2012, the last day that anyone had seen Carrie alive, police suspected that Liz had ambushed Carrie either inside her home or near her car not long after Dave left for work. They weren't sure how Liz managed to get behind the wheel of Carrie's car or how Carrie ended up in the passenger seat, but they suspected that Liz had threatened her with a knife and forced her to comply. It really didn't matter, because what did matter came next. 
Based on the blood evidence found inside Carrie's car, they stated that Carrie had been stabbed in the stomach by Liz, as described in the emails. This was done while Liz drove so that Carrie could not flee the vehicle during the attack. After this, Liz used Carrie's credit card to purchase $167 worth of cleaning supplies to thoroughly scrub Carrie's car from top to bottom. They had receipts for this purchase. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's blood soaked into the passenger seat. You, you gotta burn that sh- this was why no blood was immediately obvious inside the car. It wasn't until the police cut into the fabric that evidence of foul play was discovered. Where and how Liz disposed of Carrie's body is unknown, though police believe that she was likely dismembered, burned, and dumped somewhere remote. Once again, as described in the emails. Over the next three years, Liz then posed as Carrie online while speaking with Carrie's friends and family, providing them regular updates on her life and harassing Dave. Because Dave was such a nice guy, he had felt immense guilt for what Liz was experiencing, and Liz had used this guilt to her advantage. This is why she had directed much of the harassment at herself, calling herself a whore whenever possible. She was purposefully pushing them back together. Using the text scheduling service, Liz was able to keep these messages rolling in unabated, where she and Dave were together, which is why Dave had never suspected that Liz was the person responsible for sending them. When these messages stopped garnering Dave's sympathy, Liz chose to up the ante by setting her house on fire. What Dave didn't realize at the time was that Liz was in the process of moving to a new home when the fire was set, and she already removed all of her important belongings. The only things that burned were old furniture that she planned to leave behind anyway. And her pets. The f- Liz's plan had worked, and Dave came to her rescue. Liz had chosen to harass Dave's other love interests and Amy Flora for two reasons. To avoid raising suspicion as to why she was the only one receiving threats, and to scare away Dave's other lovers. As we've discussed, this didn't work because Dave and Amy began spending more time together. This failure is what inspired Liz to attempt to frame Amy for everything. When Dave refused to believe that Amy could be responsible, Liz had shot herself in the leg using the gun she'd stolen from his apartment and attempted to point the police at Amy, hoping to have her arrested after a brief investigation. But this move was a step too far and ultimately led to everything being exposed. On November the 9th, 2018, Shanna Elizabeth Goyler was found guilty of two counts. Murder in the first degree for taking the life of Carrie Farber and arson for burning down her own home. She was sentenced to life in prison for murder and 18 to 20 years for arson. Liz attempted to file an appeal based on two factors, that she had received ineffective counsel and that the court did not have enough evidence to prove that she had committed the murder or that Carrie was even dead in the first place. This appeal and the multiple others that Liz had filed since her conviction was rejected. Today, Liz is housed within the Nebraska Correctional Facility for Women where she continues to claim innocence. She blames Dave for framing her and claims that he is the real killer. He's not, and Dave is a good guy, and it's rubbish that he had to go through this, someone got murdered, and that this was years of people's lives who were ruined by you, Liz. And I'm glad you're in prison. It's where you belong, you psycho. That's the end of today's episode. Thanks for being here.